was funny. <laughs> There's lots of chairs up front, everyone. Come on up. <laughs> Everybody's afraid to come to the front. <laughs> Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to day, is it day three, day two? I lose track at about Tuesday at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dawn Looning. I'm a city councillor in the city of Moose Jaw. I'm on your SUMA board of directors, and I am also an advocate for Mac the Moose, in case you didn't know. <laughs> and uh, we come from uh, just a new uh, thing I got to throw out there is Moose Jaw is Canada's most notorious city and you'll know more, more about that in the near future. So um, good morning again. How did everybody enjoy Ryan Walker? I don't know how we follow that, but everybody enjoy that keynote this morning. The SUMA Board of Directors and staff uh, take a lot of time trying to pick uh, a keynote that is going to really resonate with everyone. So I hope you enjoyed uh, that session with Ryan and uh, and take the opportunity to fill out. You know, I hope you grab those uh, sheets on the table and are and maybe you'll be able to have him come in and speak to your community or do some things in your own community that that will better all of us. Right? That's what we're here for. So. Before we get into the session, I want to quickly note that safety information can be found on page 25 of your convention handbook. I'm sure this is old news, but we want to make sure our delegates are safe. So when you have a minute, please familiarize yourself with that information. So this session is being audio recorded, as are all the sessions around SUMA convention. So if you have a question for our panel today, I'm going to encourage you to go to the microphone so that when these are broadcast in about a month on SUMA's YouTube channel, everybody will be able to hear the questions. If you just r yell it out from your chair, you're probably not going to be heard on the recording. So I will urge you to go to the microphone. There's one on the far side here, and there's also one on this side. So please go to the microphone. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Randy Donauer, Patricia Warwick, Darcy Cooper, and Rodney Odette. Council Ron Randy Donauer was first elected to Saskatoon City Council in 2010 and is serving his third term. He was appointed to the SUMA board in 2016. In 2018, he began serving as a mentor with the Saskatchewan Municipal Peer Network, which connects municipal officials and administrators with mentors who can provide advice and help resolve disputes. Welcome, Randy. Thank you. Patricia Warwick is the city solicitor for the city of Saskatoon. Appointed in 2012 to that role, she has served in the city solicitor's office since starting in 1992 as an articling student. So welcome to Patricia. Thank you. Darcy Cooper is a municipal advisor with the Ministry of Government Relations. Prior to joining the ministry in September 2017, she was the town of Lumsden and RM of Lumsden number 189 for 16 years. Welcome to Darcy. And last but not least, Rodney Odette is the CAO of the Village of Bethune and RM of Dufferin 190. He started his career in municipal administration in 1990, serving the town of Maidstone and the RM of Caledonia number 99, the town of Lapman, and the town of Carndiff before taking his current role in 2010. So welcome to Rodney and just give a warm round of applause to our panel today. So for those of you with the SUMA convention app, has anybody here not downloaded, bleh, can't even talk, downloaded the app yet? Everybody in the room, oh, okay. <laughs> 
good. That's great, though. That's good. Take up on the app. It's all, that's wonderful. You can read more about our panels and our presenters in the app. When you read those full bios, you can see the work that everyone here has put into gaining the knowledge that they're going to share with you here today. When we plan our events for members, we try to tailor the topics and speakers, as I mentioned before, to facilitate your needs in your communities. So please give our speakers your full attention and be open to how their information can apply to your municipality. Some lessons are going to be easier to apply than others, but I'm sure everyone in this room is going to be able to take away some valuable information when you go back to your communities. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, I understand that this, I, my notes, I thought that the four wonderful people up here were going to be giving presentations, but I understand that isn't the case. We are open to questions from all of you, and they will fill your minds with the knowledge that they have. So, unless somebody wants to throw out some opening remarks on the panel, don't be scared. No? Okay. So, has anybody got any questions for our panelists today? Don't be shy, we got an hour and a half to kill. <laughs> and there's still people coming in. There's lots of chairs up here at the front on this side, on my, your right, my left. Yeah, Hi. go ahead, Patricia. I, I could maybe start yeah, absolutely, that part that'd be wonderful. Sure. Um, so we were, the panel was advised that some of the questions that sometimes come up in this session are around enforcement of bylaws. So I've prepared a little narrative which I can leave as a handout and I would also be willing to post for you on, um, on your website just to um, kind of give you an idea of some of the tools that you have when it comes to bylaw enforcement. Um, the, the little narrative here is entitled the Municipalities Enforcement Toolkit and it talks about things like um, notices of violation, prosecutions, orders to remedy, um, what you do in an emergency situation. Um, so if you're interested in that, I like I say, I will have some paper copies of that here if you wanna take it away, um, but I will also arrange for that to be posted on the website for all of you to have a look at. Um, the other thing that you might be interested that has been um, recently um, done by the city of Saskatoon is um, we have recently passed a uh, TNC bylaw or a ride sharing bylaw and the bylaw that was passed in the city of Saskatoon was a standalone bylaw that just applied to ride sharing. It does not apply to taxis. So if, if any municipality is interested in ride sharing, which the province has very recently enabled, you may wish to um, have a look at Saskatoon's bylaw because I think it could be easily adapted to your municipality and would, um, would allow for you to have ride sharing in your municipality. So just a couple of things to think about and if you want to ask questions about that, we're, we're here to answer the questions. Thank you, Patricia. Randy, you got some comments? Talk for a second. I see we have a speaker and I'll just encourage people. This is mostly supposed to be a Q&A session. So if you'd like to go up to the mics and get in line, that would be great. Um, but I will say thank you for the comments, Patty. So the purpose of this session is really to talk about procedures and council and governance and those sorts of things. And so you've got a panel here. You know, Rodney's an administrator and he's got lots of experience. He's also a per part of the Municipal Peer Network, which we're gonna talk about and show you a little video on later, which is a resource that's been created for the urban and rural municipalities, both for administrators and for elected officials to reach out to. And so there's a resource of information there. We have Darcy from the ministry who will provide the provincial uh, perspective. And Patty is the city solicitor here in Saskatoon. As you can see, she uh, she's actually probably one of the most experienced municipal lawyers in the province. And, and even though uh, she works for the city of Saskatoon, uh, she's got lots of legislation with her and she's been around for a few years ago. She's about 16 and um, <laughs> And she's an incredible uh, source of uh, legal information. And so any questions along any of those lines, and I'm just here to make the panel look pretty. And so uh, <laughs> if you have any questions about council operations, code of conduct, governance, enforcement of bylaws, any of those sorts of things, that's what the purpose of this panel was. And we'll do the best we can to answer your questions. So thank you. Whew, that wasn't very short, Randy, but that's all right. 
Um, <laughs> we have a question at the, I'm going to say the right microphone. So go ahead, state your name and your community for the record. Good morning. Janelle Anderson, CAO Town of Fabry. Um, my question, I guess, I'm, I'm looking for clarity, and maybe uh, Darcy and Rodney could speak to this, as to why, as an administrator, I'm not able to point out to my councillors or mayor when they may have a potential conflict of interest. Well, the legislation states that, of course, as most everybody in the room knows, that it is up to the council member to declare if they have a conflict of interest or not. Um, I wouldn't say that that precludes the administrator to, if asked by a council member, you know, what, what, are, you, what are your thoughts? You know, you just provide an opinion. Uh, Rodney may, maybe can talk more to that, but the legislation is specific that it is a council member's responsibility to declare if they have a conflict of interest. I, I think if you, as an administrator, uh, there might be the odd occasion, say, if you're doing a, an RFP for, for gravel crushing and you have a new municipality, uh, more referring to a, a circumstance in an RM, uh, and every one of your members, or say three of your members of council, have gravel pits that a potential developer might quote on. In a report to council, and I do an admin report uh, based on what the agenda items are, I'll put a, a very last line that uh, council uh, conflicts of interest or pecuniary interest should be considered in this agenda item. It's a way of putting that on the table for council that, oh, that should twig. And of course, if we're not supposed to police that, but that's one way of putting it out there for them to, to think and be cognizant of. Thanks for that comment, Rod. Thank you. Moving over here, your name and community, please. I'm Rebecca Hill, councillor for the town of Port Capel. <clears throat> I was wondering if you could comment on the pros and cons of using a committee of the whole approach versus having subcommittees within your council to address uh, certain areas within your town's area of interest. <coughs> Perhaps what are some pitfalls or things that council should consider when they're deliberating on which approach they want to undertake? Sure, so I could talk about it from Saskatoon's perspective, but I think it would be good for some of the other panelists to weigh in as well. Um, we find that um, splitting our committees up and putting different council members on different committees uh, enables us to really rely on the work of the committee uh, to spread the workload out and try and put a diversity of views on each committee so that uh, people don't get into groupthink when they break into that committee and then when they report back to the council, you might see a totally different perspective that was never discussed in committee. And so we do have uh, what we call a governance and priorities committee, which is a council of the whole, but we've got other uh, subcommittees of council that we each participate in two of them to split the workload up. And what we've done over the past few years through the help of our solicitor and clerk is actually push a lot of the pre-work and working out a lot of the uh, initial issues uh, on a bylaw or a new policy. We try and do as much of the work as we can on that in committee and then obviously committee sends that to council and deals with it that way. So we've found a lot of benefit in splitting up the work because the more we do at the, at the uh, governance and priorities committee, which is council as a whole, we tend to find that those meetings uh, are a little bit more formal. They get bogged down. They end up being very long meetings. And unless you're the first agenda item, you can find that some of the issues will get rushed. And so for us, it's a workload issue and it helps, um, helps uh, individual committees focus and, and develop a little bit of an area of expertise as well, that they're used to focusing on these types of issues, so some of the pre-work might go a little smoother, but that's just my perspective. I really don't have anything to add to what Ron just said. Okay. Can I just add a follow-on question then? Yeah. Okay. Just very quickly, sorry. Yeah, sure. So if a committee of the whole is the chosen approach that a council has op opted to go with, what are some things you think they should watch out for in that particular approach? Um, hmm. You know, I think you have to watch the size of your agenda when you're doing that and how often you meet. Um, I think um, you have to make sure that you're making sure you do the pre-work that you have to and not, um, like it, in our situation, um, it's really a workload issue and, and we, I find it more cumbersome to deal with anything in a large committee and a large board. Um, at our city council, we see council as the place 
where we are the approval mechanism and the public, uh, all of our committees are public anyways, but it's really the, uh, the opportunity where a lot of the initial details have been worked out. So I, I would just say if you're gonna do it as committee of the whole, which might be right for you, like that's fine, um, just make sure that you do your due diligence and make sure that you don't rush the agenda and take the time that you need to, to do the work. And if you find, I would just be sensitive to it, that if it's working for you, great, that's fine. There are different things that are gonna work in different municipalities, but don't be afraid to be sensitive to the idea whether you think it's being productive and maybe do a, a self-assessment of your committee uh, on a regular basis, like every year or every two or three years, and, and just have the individual members do an assessment to determine whether they think it's working or not. So those would be my comments. And Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. If we're missing the mark on our answers, don't be afraid to come with a follow-up. Yeah, that's a great comment, Randy. I was going to say, you know, because there's a lot of people in the room and we've got questions that want to be asked. If, it, if it's not quite what you want to hear, please feel free to come up afterwards and talk to our panelists afterwards. Go ahead, sir. You were next. And uh, then the lady behind you. And then we'll move right over here to... Murray Clark, uh, Mayor of Lemberg. And this is so somewhat follow-up to what... Uh, uh, the predecessor there was was talking about we, uh, we we are a committee of whole and our meetings until I became mayor were anywhere from three and a half to four hours long, and <clears throat> my question is you know what how long it's too long, and uh, you know and, and and I appreciate your comments after the the second hour, you know uh, after working all day I I'm I'm done, and. Uh, you know, it, it becomes uh, a real problem. And, and we have discussed going to committee, but our counselors, I think it's a control thing. They wanna be involved in, in hands-on. And they, they also don't have, um, you know, in my view, the commitment to work outside of council chambers. They, they don't wanna put in a, any extra work outside of the meeting. So they would sooner sit there for four hours, one, night a month rather than having, and my view is after two hours, we should have a second meeting because nobody's on task. Just your thoughts in that regard. Sure. Um, so, you know, y your council's an independent council. You're going to decide to go which way you want to go. And so if that's the way they decided to go, then you've got to find a way to make it work. Um, the control aspect of it, you know, a lot of the situations we have to deal with on council can be solved through information and, and training. And so if you or your administrator can, can get any resources, there's a lot of free resources. And if SUMA doesn't have them, we can help you find them. A lot of free resources on what best practices are. It doesn't mean Committee of the Whole isn't the best practice. It's just we might be able to get some information or help you help direct you to some information on how to make Committee of the Whole work better versus another method. I would say, uh, you know, um, I don't know if my examples relate to you or not, so that's why I'm saying if they don't, we can chat after. Um, we can tend to have some pretty long meetings, um, and you're right, the longer they go, the less logical they become um, sometimes, and, and <laughs> it, actually is, it, it <laughs> actually is concerning to us when an important issue is later on in the agenda, and, and we've actually had some meetings go from one in the afternoon to 11 at night, and, and in Saskatoon, our bylaw says if you don't finish, you come back the next day. So, But here's what we have done that might be able to relate to you. With the help of our clerk and our solicitor, our procedures bylaw, actually dictate specific breaks in the meeting and we actually on our council days we start meeting at one uh, by by law we adjourn at five if we're not done we really like to be done by five but if we're not done by five we take a break we actually have some free time for about an hour we have a dinner together um, and, and then we resume and have our hearings at six if hearings goes long we have set basically every couple hours in our bylaw the mayor calls uh, an, um, a break in the meeting and we take 15, 20 minutes. Sometimes that's all we need to keep the meeting productive. So if they wanna keep it as committee of the whole, um, <laughs> just maybe plan some regular breaks and, and take a half hour to stretch Very and get some suggestion. fresh air. That, mi that mi might help. Regarding the control issue, sorry my answer's going long. Regarding the control issue, just what I was trying to say there is keep reminding <laughs> your counselors, um, and we have to do this with ourselves all the time, Council always will have the final say. Um, and, and my perspective is not that if a committee is doing some work on an important issue and I don't sit on the committee, I don't look at it at all as though I've given up some level of control. 
my perspective on that whole thing is thank you colleagues for rolling up your sleeves and doing all the ground level work and presenting that to us so we can make an informed, logical, rational decision and debate it at council level. Okay. So thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. They disappeared. Go ahead, sir. Your name and community. Uh, Kurt Turner from Beachy, Mayor. Um, my, uh, I'm looking for some guidance on recording of uh, our council meetings. Uh, I have support for uh, having security camera. Uh, quite often you see it in businesses. It says, you know, unruly behavior will not be tolerated and this is being recorded. You see these little signs all the time. Um, I have support for that for our um, administrator. But what I don't have support for is recording the meetings. Um, and I think in the, in the past we had a, a counselor that has since uh, given his resignation. But I think if we had had that uh, recording, I think what it does is it keeps behavior in check. And um, so I guess there's two things. Uh, you know, your opinion on, on keeping behavior in check and then also the fact that I believe in total transparency and yet we have uh, three returning counselors anywhere from 10 to 26 years on council and um, they don't want um, council meetings on, on recording. Thank you. Uh, my comment first would be um, always check uh, with your solicitor uh, and be mindful of what the uh, privacy regulations may be. And if it's permitted, uh, it's something that probably should be included then in your procedural bylaws uh, for running your meetings. But I will ask someone else that has an issue. Along that same lines too, if, if council does decide to record the meetings, um, you'll wanna make sure that the uh, retention of those recordings are addressed in your records retention bylaws. They've turned my mic off. There's nobody <laughs> hearing from me. You catch on quick here. That's Three great. times, right? Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think if and when you do it, it's just got to be something that you do very openly and publicly, and and check the legalities of it, and make sure that uh, everybody on council and the public is aware of what you're doing. In Saskatoon, uh, unless it's an in-camera meeting. We actually videotape and audio tape all of our meetings. We actually have uh, our council and all of our standing policy committees are actually a live feed on TV and they're all accessible on the internet to go back and watch later. So you can actually go back several years now and watch any of our city council meetings if you like uh, torturing yourself um, <laughs> or any of our significant standing policy meetings. And we just actually see it as embracing technology as the best practice. Um, and so it's not an issue for us at all. The public is more than welcome and encouraged to come and attend our meetings. And so us videotaping it and actually, even if you can't put it on a website, you know, if you don't have the resources to put it on a website for the public to watch, uh, to have it, I would actually promote it as a resource for your public. But, uh, and I can say it absolutely affects the behavior in council. I'll tell you that for sure. So. The, um uh, when I was down at mayor's school, it was one thing that they strongly suggested that we do was to have cameras in meetings. And um, so I just took it from there and I brought it up a couple of times, but you know, I have so much resistance, but they're in favor of having it for when people come in and maybe they complain that their water bill is too high or, yeah. or whatever, that we have it for security for our... Yeah. Um, if I was you, I wouldn't approach it from... A spying on people perspective, which I know you're not, I were promoted as a public accessibility and accountability issue, and uh, it's pretty hard to stand up and argue against that, to be honest with you. Thank you. If you want to stay on council. Thank you. Come on, there's got to be a question in the room. Oh, there we go. <laughs> go ahead. Okay, this stems back to yesterday, when we were doing all of the um, motions and whatnot. Um, with regards to the more than three month leave, what came to me, it bothered me all night, not just being a woman in politics, but um, there was a couple comments that bothered me, but that's okay. The more I thought about it, though, more, though the more I thought personal agenda. So if once you get elected, we're in for so many years, 
So then you go and you wanna extend it. If that extended part were over three months just because there was certain circumstances, did get passed, would it not be wise to make it for the next election? So no one going into it in a position or in a state of being would therefore take advantage if the constituents weren't aware of it when they were running it. Does that make sense? Anyone. Mm -hmm. I can, yeah, I can take that. So where this stems from is uh, the section in legislation regarding disqualification of a council member. Yes. So a council member is deemed to be disqualified if they miss um, three months, um, they're absent from meetings and it's gotta be at least two meetings held within that period. So what it, the legislation allows is for council to pass a resolution to authorize an extended leave. It wouldn't affect the election, it would just be within that term that council member is serving. You know what I was talking about? Sorry, the change they wanted to extend it for more than three months. Right. And if they, if that was passed during, like say now, heaven forbid I was going to go into an eternal way, and uh, <laughs> all of a sudden, <laughs> boom, I wanna take the next year off. But my, and then I'm fighting for this before I do that, would that, that not have conflict of interest or like a personal agenda in mind that now I'm pushing this now that I am this way and not just that way I could know that I'm going for major surgery and I'm going to be off for a year you know it's if I can't trust my counselors to approve what I need and I'm trying to you know change the whole course of things there there is a little bit of personal agenda in there is there not well it would it would apply to if council was to develop a policy and accept that by resolution it would probably apply to any member of council within that situation, particular okay. situation that they're defining. Okay. So, I mean, there is, there is room, I mean, a council member can request that that absence be approved and then just declare your conflict of interest and, and you know, leave the room and, okay. and let council make that decision. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, I don't think I'm posing the question properly though, sorry. You know, like it's, um, it's okay, last night, yesterday when it came out and it was one of the urgent ones or important ones that didn't make the paper in time or whatever. Um, if that had been passed then and the person or the people promoting it were fighting for themselves rather than the all, you know what I mean? Like they're already in a position where they wanna be able to take advantage of this and they're passing it now. If it was passed last night would it, or yesterday, would it not have put us into a position that it would say, okay, you know what, this is passed now, but we're gonna make it for the next election because no one right now should be able to take advantage of it. Because it wasn't I, in the pre- Yeah, I think I know what you're know what getting at is that it, it, I'll give you just a quick example that's happened in, in Mushan. I think it's happened in all the communities with this third that the federal government has taken away from us with our pay. And I know a lot of the councils have dealt with, okay, you know, our, I know in Musha, I'll use Musha. Are we gonna give ourselves a raise? My position has been at the council table. I will, I'll only vote for that if it applies at the next election. I'm not gonna sit in the chair and say, I'm gonna put my hand up and give myself a raise. That's just me. If, because I knew what I was in for when I signed up and won the election two years ago and what happens you know, in that respect. So I think that's what you're getting at exactly. is that we knew what we yes. signed up for. Should it happen at the next, yeah, I think it, that's what she's trying yeah, to ask. Yeah, if any big so. changes so come up th that way, yes. Sure, so I'll address it just briefly since it was out of Saskatoon. Uh, and I don't wanna re-debate re resolutions that came, but I do wanna answer your question. So thank you for the question. Um, the resolution yesterday wouldn't have had any impact on, on your municipality whatsoever. All it would have done is it would have given permissive authority to a municipality to enact policy if they wanted to, but there would be no requirement for you to do that. So if you didn't want to do anything, you didn't have to do anything different today. Your life would be exactly the same today as it was yesterday. In Saskatoon, um, what we wanted to do was get away from actually having a counselor having to advocate for themselves, getting themselves a specific benefit. We wanted the authority to be able to create a policy that would apply to all future councils so that a specific counselor wasn't putting a conflict of interest, having to ask council for a leave because they thought staying at home with a little one or whatever other situation was approved. We were trying to actually take the conflict of interest and the personal experience out of it and create a policy. The argument though is very good that should we, any policy, and I agree with Councillor Looney, any policy 
that give you a benefit as a counselor that you didn't have before would be good to uh, you know bring in after the next election so that if the public wants to debate it at election time they can so it's a very good question the change in legislation wouldn't trigger that for you. What would trigger that for you is if your municipality decided then, oh, that's something we want to do, then that's the debate you would have. Okay. But if you didn't want to do it, uh, you, you didn't have to. So. Okay. And okay. just one quick thing. Sure. We should never be compared to employment. We're elected officials. Yeah, Our and I get that. Our told us, yeah, it like should never be compared. Though. Yeah, I absolutely get it. Um, yeah. the, um, the public will judge our behavior and our actions, um, and they're the ones that elect us, and they're the ones that'll fire us. Yeah, exactly. So I Thank get you. it. Yeah, Thank, Thank you, you very much. Go ahead, your name and community, please. I'm Diane Flanders, Councilman for Pontex. I was just wondering how you get the general public to come to meetings, or even just write a letter of their concern because they say, oh, you're a councilman, would you do this? <laughs> you know, take it to the meeting, but we actually have to have a letter or they have to come and talk to us. It's not all right. Yeah. Who wants to take that one? Well, Darcy? Yeah, um, well, one thing uh, it's important for the public to understand and know is that one single council member does not make the decision. It is the council as a whole that will make the mm -hmm. decision. So it's important for them to know and understand that. How, how can you convince people to come to the meetings? We put up the, you know, the schedule of our meetings and we just don't seem to get people coming. <laughs> Public engagement is, is something that every small community, and I mean, I'm not so much in the larger ones perhaps, but um, any small community is difficult to, to get. Um, how many communities here have done a zoning, a uh, redo of their zoning bylaw and you have a public meeting to have people come in and look at your zoning bylaw and you spend eight hours in a hall and you have one person show up. It, it's all about if they want to be engaged and it's very difficult to get a public engaged and you might have to do things like annual newsletters, um, more posting on social media or on your websites. Those are both the, the, the tools that you have to try and get them engaged but sometimes you just can't put a rope around them and drag <laughs> them in for anything. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, sir. Hi, right, Pat Detzel for Mayor of Town of Macklin. Um, my question is basically with respect to council debating issues on their agenda and making motions towards it. Uh, what I what I would like to ask is: Is it advisable to have your administration speak on those motions more so than just the financial uh, strategies and the procedures? question <laughs> <laughs> the role of the administrator of course is to to advise council on policy uh, legislative requirements that perhaps should be followed and considered there are a number of times when uh, and I've been party to it where council say what kind of opinion would an opinion would you throw on the table for us to consider on this particular matter my job is to sometimes be a bit of a devil's advocate provide a bit of perspective and uh, and but not so much guide but perspective and, and knowledge of uh, policy and legislation so I guess it's going to be up to that individual council how um, how they would want to have that information provided to them from the administrator would it be politically correct to have administration just provide it or when asked Tougher question. <laughs> Again, I, I would say you, the role of the administrator is to provide uh, direction on policy and legislation. So if there's something that's missing or that needs to be debated, I think it, it's absolutely okay for an administrator to provide that consideration. Not so much the, the uh, inclusion in the debate, but at least the information there so that council has that information. Especially when um, say there's uh, council or administrators that don't provide a written report um, on agenda items and if there's no written report sometimes they have to provide background information on, on a, a topic. So I think it's essential that at times yes an administrator is going to pro try to provide some perspective on, a, on an agenda item. Not so much the discussion and the decision making. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning Renaud, 
Good. Your name and community, please. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Reno Bissonette, Town of Assiniboia. We're having a, I think we're going to have a struggle this year with uh, bylaws. Um, how do you enforce a bylaw in a small community when you don't have the man force to do that? You write letters, you can write a letter, and then what if somebody doesn't comply? Do you got to hire somebody? Or, you know, it's, what's the sense of having bylaws when people are breaking bylaws and you don't have the, the finances to move forward on, on a lot of things, untidy premise and things like that. And then when you do in an untidy premise, and I'm only saying untidy premise because there's lots of yards that, you know what, they're a disaster and you want to do something about it and they don't. Like, there's got to be an easier way of doing things than the way we do it. Do you know what I mean? Like, in a small town, it's really hard. Like, do we hire somebody? You know what, pay somebody forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, like the commissioners or whatever, to come down, and it's like, well, we're kind of trying to do something, and it's we're finding out it's not worth it, so we let them go, and then now we have more bylaws that are like, you know, or do we wait until somebody makes a complaint and they have to complain in paper? Do we set up a system where somebody can complain without having to put their name down? Because lots of people don't want to put their name down. Or do we have a system where if you're complaining, the person who's getting complained on, do they have a right to say to see who complained and say, well, this is a personal vendetta or something? Do, do you know what I mean? Like, it, it's a real issue that I struggle with, with bylaws. I think bylaw enforcement is difficult for every municipality. Uh, it doesn't matter really what size. Uh, when, it, when it comes to small communities, the small urban, um, just by a show of hands here, which communities here have bylaw enforcement officers? Now, which communities utilize those bylaw enforcement officers on a regular basis? <coughs> so I, it's a matter, I think, of, of the elected biting the bullet and saying, if we want our bylaws enforced, we'll have to go down that road of bylaw enforcement and bylaw enforcement officer. I know in the village of Bethune uh, and the Arm of Duffin, we've, we've had to go that route because as you say, <coughs> we have bylaws that weren't being enforced, so why have them? Um, we were fortunate enough that we've partnered with some, uh, an individual from the city of Regina that's a former bylaw enforcement officer and we have a contract and we, it's a per event contract. So we don't have a monthly fee, we don't have any, uh, you know, budgetary costs except when we use them. So maybe okay. that's something that might have to be entertained. Okay, so right now we don't have one. Somebody breaks a bylaw. So it's, it's really hard to pick and choose which bylaws you're gonna enforce. You know, is it somebody, oh, you drive by and it's like, oh, that guy's fence is too close to the sidewalk or something like that. Like, do you wait until somebody makes that complaint as counsel or do you pick on that person and say, oh, by the way, you gotta move your fence back or do something like that? I think that depends on, on the engagement of council, how, how far or how, um, how much they want to do for as far as enforcement. Um, in some jurisdictions, uh, there's policy in place where council doesn't enact anything until there's a written complaint. Okay. Not a phone call to the office, not a phone call to a council member complaining that uh, either a fence is in the wrong spot or, or so-and-so is <coughs> piling the snow on his, on his neighbor or whatever. It's always written, complaint driven in, in, most, in most places. Okay, so that person that comes in doesn't want to write a letter saying that, but they come into the office and make a complaint. So then they walk out and say, well, I don't want to write a letter. So you tell them, well, we can't do anything about it. So they walk out, they're upset. And it's like, you know, sometimes common sense prevails where, you know, that person has a legit complaint. They just don't want to put their name on it because they don't want that person to find out then they're gonna be mad, like, you know how it is with a neighbor, you know, you don't wanna piss off your neighbor, but at the same time, you want something done. I don't, I don't wanna cut you off, Reno, but I think, I think it might be good if you have a conversation maybe After? with the panelists okay. afterwards, just cause I, th I think that's we're kind of, yeah, yeah, at a stand, if that's all right. Thank you though, for your question. Go ahead, sir, and then we've got you next. So, your name and community for the record. Right. Greg Nagel from Moss Bank. I just want to address a uh, moment for the question, uh, the question or the comments that the fellow just before Renault came about information and what we're doing and what I learned at, uh, uh, in conversation with someone uh, from Alberta who did a study for their 
uh, information and guiding their councils to he came up with or they came up with an acronym called BIRD, B-I-R-D. And perhaps you've heard it and perhaps you're using it already w unintentionally. But what we've asked our administration to do is uh, background information, request for decision. And so what we've, we've asked our, our administration to, we've got a, a situation that we aren't really doing our own due diligence, whether that be through committee or whether the committee as a whole, our administration provides some guidance, what, where that information come from, that's the background information. And then he will say, okay, you guys, we've got to make a decision here. We don't want this to be running around the table constantly. And, and for us, it's helped us. We're still in the learning stages of applying that. But we find it very beneficial, and it's also moved our meetings uh, ahead in addressing that timeline. So instead of the four-and-a-half-hour meeting, we're, we're shooting for two-and-a-half hours. And, and going home. So it's just helped us be better at what we're doing. Perhaps, I don't know, that's just a suggestion more, more than anything. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Is that me? <laughs> Go ahead. Hello, uh, Jonathan Torson from uh, City of Lloyd Minster. Um, I just have another question in regards to conflict of interest. Um, preface it by saying that I follow pretty strict rules as far as even if it looks like it could be conflict of interest, when in doubt, get out. Um, but is there any responsibility on administration's side to let, like actual responsibility on their side to let a counselor know? Because I've run into a specific situation. I work for an engineering firm, although I'm an employee, but when in doubt, get out, bonus eligible employee, it's kind of complicated. But where they were a sub consultant under a prime consultant, therefore not listed in the agenda report, so my employer, for whatever reason, didn't let me know, and uh, and administration didn't let me know that you know my employer was a subconsultant on this project. Luckily, I all I talked about was price, and then they ended up getting dropped as a subconsultant anyway. So I didn't break any rules, but it was incredibly uncomfortable for me when I realized that you know this is something where I potentially could have conflicted myself without having any idea. So um, there's no legal responsibility on the, on the administration to do that. However, um, a couple of things, um, and just again what we do in Saskatoon. So we try to twig um, the members of council that they may have a conflict of interest by included it, including it on every single agenda that we have. So we have a separate section on each of our agendas which says de declaration of conflict of interest. What that does, we hope, is it helps the council members to, when they're going through the agenda, to identify for themselves whether or not they have a conflict and then at the beginning of each meeting they can kind of think about that and decide. Um, the, other thing, the other thing that we do, and it's more of a courtesy, is when we have a member of council, and when I say we, I mean the administration, when we have a member of council who we know um, has declared conflict on a regular basis on, on something, um, we kind of look out for it, um, and then we advise the councillor or member of council, if it happens to be the man, um, you know, there's something coming up, we're, we're suspicious that you might declare a conflict, so just so, so you know. So that's the other thing that we do, just out of courtesy. Then the other, the other point, though, is that in your situation, um, you might, had you gotten into trouble there, you, you would have had, you know, legal defenses to what happened there, because it sounds to me like that was a situation that occurred through inadvertence or what have you. Right. So, um, you know, we try and there is no obligation but we try to be courteous um, and try to give as many cues as we can. And then, based on your circumstance, you you know you may have a you may have a defense or an argument about the situation. Thank you. Again, I got lucky on this one. I didn't conflict myself, but I'm not a crook. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think your comment is a good one, though, because I learned that a long time ago too in my early term on council. Um, a former city solicitor said the exact same thing to me if, because there was a particular issue that I said, I think, I think I might be in a conflict of interest on this. And he, and he said, 
if you even think you have a feeling on this, get out. So that's, it, I, it's always been a, a rule of thumb for me as well. Go ahead, sir. Your name and community. Hello, I'm uh, Tracy Yowzi, town of Kwanzaa. So I understand with cities and larger centers that you have city managers and fa like uh, facility managers. But with the smaller communities, quite often you have the town council and then a rec board and then subcommittees from the rec board. And I think the main question is how do you bridge the gap between town council and rec boards? And uh, part two would be how do you, um, we're finding that our, our rec board is taking on, like wearing too many hats, like the rec board president is also the rank committee president and also the rank rep. And um, the RM rep is now the vice president of the rec board. And, and then you, we have some members there, four members at large that really have no position. And how can a town assert themselves or, or what power do we have to control situations like that? Generally, recreation boards are going to be created by council bylaw. Um, so it depends on what the bylaw says, and you can always, you know, amend that bylaw maybe to include some reporting mechanisms for your committee uh, to the council. Mm -hmm. uh, understanding that, you know, volunteers are super important. Um, so just maintaining that respectful sort of relationship back and forth and them knowing that they're a part of the bigger organization or municipality. So. Yeah, like, like I think originally maybe the rec board was appointed position from the council, but over the years, we they just, they've been allowed to appoint themselves. So then we'll come to a meeting and we'll hear, oh, so-and-so is the new rec board president. And we're like, oh, okay. You know, and not that it's a bad thing, but we, we just seem to... We have a, a town representative, but we can't always make all the meetings. And so if we, if we don't, then we hear a month later what maybe has happened. Go ahead. <laughs> this is my <laughs> I'm Amanda Ryman, counselor in Kwanzaa. Um I think just to follow up with what Tracy's asking, um, we're, we've given over a certain element of control. And we do have a bylaw. Um, the rec boards budget is supplied by the town. They get a certain amount of money to then uh, distribute between the smaller committees for the recreation facilities. Um, so I think what we are looking for is maybe some suggestions on how to get our control back. Um, and then a concern, a concern that we have is the high rate of turnover of the volunteers. So we could have someone living in the community for a week, nobody know who they are, and nobody else wants to appoint themselves as rec board president, so that person's doing it. So it's, we're finding it hasn't been this bad in a while, but um, there are people on, on the rec board that are wearing too many hats and, and maybe shouldn't even be wearing one to begin with. <laughs> to look at, at the composition of your uh, bylaw, is, it a, is, is the town establishing the rec board as, the, as a committee? No. Okay. That's where I think that you would have to start because you, the, the rec board may have a, uh, a bylaw that doctrines what and how they are comprised and what they're supposed to do with their function. But if, it, if the town is just providing funding, you really have no control unless the town has established a recreation board, in, in, my, in my view. Well, that's how it feels, is we have no control, yeah. so you're probably right. Um, do you have a suggestion as to how we get that or how we could maybe um, respectfully try and get some provide some guidance to them or maybe get, get some of that control back? I would suggest in, in contacting some communities that have established by bylaw recreation boards that they appoint members to and see what kind of composition there is to that bylaw and see how they function. <laughs> we got help right here, so Perfect. thank you. <laughs> thank you. Go ahead, Jesse. Common thing that we hear, um, if rec boards are established by, by the council and everything's running along fine and nobody's really thinking about the other party, 
it, it never gets to be a, a problem until there's a problem and then you've got to deal with it. So if you do have your rec boards and you don't have a problem, great, but you know, start communicating with them. Open that you know, two-way communication with them before there's a problem. Thank you, Darcy. Go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Renee. I'm the mayor of Aberdeen, and we've dealt with this issue. Um, our town and our M fund, um, the, we equally give money to rec to the rec board, which is the umbrella of all the other other agencies throughout the town. And uh, we'd had the same people. That would be the president of the rec board, president of the dance fund, pr president. Of, and so we actually have uh, bylaw. You can't be on more than three committees because there'd be somebody on seven committees, which is controlling all the finances, which can dictate every single group. So we, we have bylaws that, that help with that, and it, we found it really straightened out our, com our community um, for funding. But the other problem is when you have that issue is certain people that are running all the boards, the other community members don't like them. So you can't get volunteers because they don't want to be on the board. And so we, that's why we actually put in a bylaw that you could only be on three committees. And it really helped our committee, but I can help you guys with some stuff that we have as well. Thank you for that. Go ahead, sir. Speaking to the same issue, uh, sir, uh, oh, sorry, Murray, yeah. Murray Gray, uh, Town of Mooseman. Speaking to uh, that exact thing, we, we abolished our, our rec committee a long time ago. As, re as a town grows and you have more recreation facilities, I, I, I think it's a danger in order to have non-elected officials in charge of a budget. So by taking back and making those decisions within a subcommittee, in the, we have a recreation committee within council that, that once we got control of that, then we had answers for where, where the money's going by people who are elected because essentially in your town, the people that are running your rec committee don't answer to anybody. They're not elected or they're making themselves appointed. So just a point to it that that, that is a way to take control of it is bring it back within council, uh, especially when it's the, your taxpayers' money that they're spending, so. Thank you. My name's Ed Lehman. I'm from, I'm a counselor from QPAR. And uh, I think our town is experiencing probably one of the same issues that other communities are experiencing, and that is our health needs have increased, but our service has actually declined. So I'm one, and we seem to be spinning our wheels over and over again by just asking the responsible authorities for the actions that would lead to uh, the proper care level being established. So I'm wondering what kind of things would you suggest as strategy and tactics to have an effective campaign to have primary health care at the level that we need in the community. Thank you. Don't all jump to your microphones at once. <laughs> as we all, be this has been my, my, my meme for the whole week as I, Bart Simpson going through. Did, does, any, does anybody from the floor have a comment on that, what they do in their community? Yeah. I tell you, I'll, tell you ahead, how to sir, I'll tell you how to fix that. Can you state uh, your Dennis name? Dennis Helmuth, uh, Mayor, Town of Roster. And Thank you. I'll, flag, I'll fly the flag of regional cooperation again. Uh, it seems to me, and I don't know the geographical circumstances that might be referenced here, but in our context, we go, we're having tremendous success with physician retention uh, potential new hospital replacement, and it's because of regional cooperation. Likewise, to the topic of uh, bylaw enforcement, for us, it's it, we seem to have things under control somewhat, and again, it's because of regional cooperation. So when your community is working with others, you have capacity, and uh, I know it takes administration to work towards mutual agreements, and, uh, but nonetheless, I would really, really strongly encourage smaller communities when you have difficulties getting services uh, provided to your citizens, look to your neighbors for some assistance. Thank you. Go ahead, Randy. I can make a comment. I'm not gonna 
do an education session on how to lobby the provincial government, though I would say that that's what SUMA's role is. And so I just encourage you, it might not be the specific of the answer that you want to hear, but tomorrow we're going to have breakout sessions and the Minister of Health, Minister of Rural and Remote Health, we're going to come tomorrow. I'm going to be uh, moderating that session, and I would just encourage you to come and speak openly to them about your concerns. You probably have in the past, uh, but make sure you do it again. And, and SUMA provides some advocacy, uh, an advocacy role, and keep working through SUMA and talk to the minister tomorrow and, and see what kind of an answer that you get. Thank you, Randy. Go ahead. Uh, Jonathan Torson, Councillor, City of Lloydminster. Um, I just have a question on best practice. Um, as far as kind of makeup of committees that are doing negotiations. Um, and these are kind of the in-camera ones where, you know, the public would not be welcome to them. It's negotiation with another party, uh, those types of things. Um, but the facilitators that we were working with on this particular item suggested that we have four of seven councillors appointed to it. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, that was one of the big pushbacks from other members of council. I was wondering, I was wondering how you would look at that. And it also has no alternates or observers included in uh, in this um, terms of reference for the negotiation committee. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> when you say, uh, am I being a little too honest? Um, just sorry, Jonathan. When you say negotiation, can I just want to get, make sure I got the right frame of reference. Are you well, talking this employee? Is this is public knowledge, I suppose, because yeah. the debate happened in a public meeting once already. Right. Um, it's an annexation negotiation oh. committee. Okay, between two municipalities? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of how we do that here in Saskatoon. Like, a, a, a lot of the groundwork done in those cases is done through our administrations and, yeah. and we actually don't have a committee of councils that specifically participates in the negotiation. That may be a capacity issue for other municipalities and, and I understand that and I get that. Um, we find working through those things works better when you try and keep things that are best practices uh, you know, across Saskatchewan and across the country and getting professional input and getting your professionals together, they're probably more likely to agree well, um, and, and I just want to add to that, that yeah, there yeah. is two s kind of separate committees built into that, one that's purely administration and one that's more on the political side in terms of what do we want, what do you want, that type of thing. Right. Um, I, I don't know if Patty has any questions. Like, we really, I'll, I'll just be honest with you, we really push hard to keep electeds at a governance level and not get involved in what I would call an administrative thing, and, unless... And so I don't mean to oversimplify it, and it's easier in Saskatoon. We've got a couple thousand staff. Um, but as much as possible, um, you know, speaking to one of the other questions, um, we really, ab about what type of information an administration should bring, we always see that there's, there's two perspectives at, at a city council. One is the administrative, or what I call a professional perspective, and we expect the administration to bring me the best professional advice they can, whether they think council's gonna like it or not. Council sees things from a different perspective. We add in the community awareness and public perspective, which isn't always the same as the professional perspective. So a lot of our committees, we would probably minimize council participation on that and try and keep the negotiations at an administrative or what I, what I would call a professional level. And as much as possible, leave your, your governance level or your councils to be directing admin on what your platform is going into negotiation and then making decisions after the fact. Smaller municipalities may not have the ability to do that as much, I don't know, but that's what our goal would be. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and if I miss the mark, we can chat after, so. Yeah, no, I, okay. close enough. All right, thanks. <laughs> thank you. Go ahead, your name and community. Hi, I'm Kelly Tekarczyk, I'm from the town of Wadena. Actually, I was just following up with the comment about healthcare, I will also out myself as an employee of the Saskatchewan Health Authority. I am one of the directors of Primary Health. Um, so I think one of the things you can do as well is invite those directors and executive directors to your council meetings to make sure that they know what is going on in your community, what are your concerns, what are you seeing, with our new direction um, that we are going to be involving and, and engaging all of those stakeholders. And so I would invite you um, 
some of you are my area, some of you are not, but um, I would invite you to find out who those people are if they haven't found you and invite them to your meetings so that you can speak to them. Thank you. Go ahead, your name and community, sir. Hi there, I'm uh, Terry Trask, I'm a counselor at Kenora. It's kind of new to the business, I just came in in the last election. Um, with the, getting back to the recreation, it's my understanding that we get uh, recreational grants uh, and, and Kenora, Kenora gets their, their, uh, their own recreational grant. We're s surrounded by three different mu municipalities and currently they get their <coughs> recreational grants for their municipality. And then we're su surrounded by three or four little towns that uh, they all they all s use a swimming pool in Kenora and they all use the, the rink and the skating, r or the skating rink and the curling rink and yet that recreational grant stays out the municipality. Does anybody have any ideas or steps we can take? Like sure, I come up with the idea of uh, uh, sending a letter to the local RMs to have them <coughs> give us their grant and then form a board or together so you can decide what you're gonna spend your money on. But does anybody have any ideas about who we can get a hold of or get, get some ideas on what we can do there? Because with the age, like first of all, the rink needs work and it's like every, every other little town, the, the rink is 40 years old. The pool is gonna need to be replaced here shortly because it's needing a, a couple hundred thousand dollars and I think every little town's kind of like that age. Just looking for some information. Well, I think there's probably a, a good number of examples in, in uh, the rural areas where there's agreements between uh, urban and urban and rural and urban municipalities that provide uh, for funding assistance for recreation. And uh, what I would suggest, uh, Terry, is after the session, if, if anyone that's in here, and um, I could probably mention a, a couple of names like um, Carniff, uh, uh, Lapman, for example, they've got those types of, uh, of agreements in place between municipalities. Uh, if they could get a hold of you and, and maybe share some information. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I guess my question is, how do you get um, the rest of council to be engaged in your meetings? I have a council that does, doesn't seem to be engaged. They don't prepare for meetings. They don't, um, they don't wanna sit on committees, nothing. And so I find myself as the one and only female counselor doing the majority of the boards and meetings and all of that. And I just want some, I guess, some tips and tricks of how to engage them. They won't come to SUMA. They, um, they're too busy. And so that's, that's sort of one of those things that, I, d I don't know. I don't know how to engage them and not, not be the, I guess, I, the one always bringing it up. Insightfulness panel. <laughs> well, Rodney. <laughs> I guess mine is just a comment as an administrator over the course of, uh, you know, 29 years or whatever. Every council is likely going to be a little different with regards to the level of engagement. Some communities have council members that um, e they might be on council for 12, 16 years. They're always engaged. They're always participating. They're going to SUMA, they're going to workshops so that they can uh, provide better decision-making processes in their community. There are some communities that have a difficult time getting member, uh, people in the community to run for council and you can't twist anyone's arm for that. And that's unfortunate at some times because it does put a lot of burden on, on other council members and, and admin staff when there is um, a level of engagement that's not high. So my suggestion as an administrator would be just to you know, pound on the council table and say, you guys, you need to buck up and, and help out a little bit. But th that's, I mean, that's a, a comment of mine. <laughs> Randy? I think it's all thank you for your service to your community because I think several people in the room can probably relate to that. And so thank you. Um, this is the dilemma of being an elected official, right? You did not elect your colleagues. Um, the public did. and and. Uh, it's not a pre-assembled team, um, and I'm sure there's probably days where my council wishes that I wasn't there. Um, 
but um, we work with the counsel that we're given and so we have to be cooperative. I think open and honest dialogue, you might wanna have some personal private communications, you may want to very respectfully share what your goals for what a win as a council would be mm -hmm. and very respectfully and politely challenge your council to be better for the good of the community. I think several of the questions that we're hearing today um, deal with capacity issues. Um, so to whatever extent you're possible, uh, that is possible for you, uh, either you or your administration, try and reach out and see if you can find resources. Um, and this is really for a lot of towns and villages and, and cities. Um, if you as a council or your administration has the ability to get resources to share with your council, um, things like best practices, things like code of conduct, things like conflict of interest, um, just sometimes we get caught up in doing the business of council and you actually need to put some focus into yourself as an entity and a group and how do we work better as a council. And if you put all your effort into running the city and don't put any effort into how you as a council function from a governance level, um, you, you could find yourself lacking. And so I would just say, now it's easy for me, right? I look to the lady on my right and I say, uh, bring us a training session on governance and, and they do that for us after an election. But uh, you may not have the resources to do that, but I think we would share some of our resources with you and I think SUMA would share some of their resources mm -hmm. with you. And I know there's excellent websites like Deloitte has a website on governance that it's all free. And so um, to the extent you can, sometimes specific issues can be caught by, by dealing with capacity issues and educating people and giving them more information and a spark will come. This is where I wish I had a gavel for you. And yeah, yeah. You know, and I'll, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you. Um, go ahead, sir. And then you're next, and then there's a lady behind you. Go ahead. Oh, uh, Pat Detzel, uh, Mayor of Town of Macklin. This time of the year, our council probably isn't any different than the majority of councils where we have a committee sit down and negotiate uh, wages for our town foremen, our employees, the, I guess the rest of the employees within town. The pet peeve I have is when we do administration, we always get that nice little paper that has where our administrators should be placed wage-wise. Um, I don't know if this is a conflict of interest for the administration sitting up there, but who makes up that paper? <laughs> Well then, <laughs> who's gonna take that one? Rodney stepping up no to the comment. plate. Yeah. <laughs> With regards to the, the urban administrator salary guideline, the suggested guideline that is sent out, that's sent, f first I'll, I'll comment on, on how we arrive at those numbers. The, the association does a num uh, good deal of work in surveying our members to see where they are in, in the wage scope. Did you say, Rodney, that's what that's UMass, right? Right. Yes. Yeah, sorry. In, in, yeah. in case anybody isn't clear on that. So we, we gauge our members through survey. We also uh, go to uh, sister organizations to s uh, that are professional, and we gauge a comparison. We also go, uh, the last time we've done it was actually across Canada for a comparison. Uh, then we, we compile that information, and that's sent to SUMA for um, their review and for their acknowledgement and then we take that to our individual council members saying this, this guideline has been uh, endorsed by SUMA as a, as a framework or as a, a starting point in salary negotiation. So it's not the individual administrator that's coming up with that number, it's the association and it's all the homework that they've done to try to, to get to that number. Right, no, and I, I realize it was an administration locally that gave us that number. Uh, uh, and you know what, I'm not seeing it as a bad idea. I'm just wondering why uh, the administration wouldn't go further and go uh, for you know average salaries for members of council or for uh, foremen or for other employees within the organization. Well, the, the guideline that we have is, is done by our, our organization. So for public works, for example, myself as an administrator and probably every administrator in here, we do email surveys and phone surveys of neighboring municipalities for public work salaries for guidelines to, to come up with a, a salary grid, so to speak. Um, those that, that don't, they just rely on their council and, and their local uh, in, in economic or employment atmosphere to set those wages. 
Uh, right now, I don't think in the province, other than with uh, for public works in, in municipalities, that your public works foreman is a member of uh, CPWA. They don't send out or they don't do any historical data on public works salary guidelines. Uh, there is information out there, and I can't remember the one that uh, uh, when I was in Carnage that we used to get, but they would send out an annual update of uh, council indemnities, uh, public work salaries, uh, admin salaries, right across Canada. So that information is, is out there. Uh, you have to pay for, for that one, but it is out there. Okay, thank you. And just in case, Rod, if you are talking to administration and that being ours, let them know that I do believe he is the best one in Saskatchewan. <laughs> thank I you, sir. I would agree. Go ahead. We're running uh, close to the end of the session, so I see two more questions, and then I know Randy mentioned that there's a video that we'd like to share as well, and if there's any other wrap-up questions, you might want to get up to the microphone right away. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Cheryl Weider from the Village of Mars, and I just wanted to give some insight on the REC um, situation. We engaged our RM. Um, we have another small town about 12 miles away that has some bigger facilities than we do, but to be able to keep it, the facilities in our small community, um, we have some funding from RRM, and I would just suggest that they go to the local RMs and have some free discussions and encourage them to support, because their children are probably using, or their grandchildren are probably using these facilities um, and you can pull your resources together to keep your community alive. I do know our curling rink got shut down, and when it did, we lost a lot of people out of our community. So I encourage you to take the time, invite the RRMs, have a special meeting, and try to get some funding into your community. Don't lose these like we did. Thanks. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Joanne Brochu with the Village of Elbow. I just have a comment in regards to council engagement. Uh, every year we have taken the practice up at Elbow to do a review of our employees. And I know in my previous experience as a school board member that we also had a review of us as a board member. And I'm wondering if SUMA couldn't uh, develop some sort of uh, review that could be conduct conducted at for councillors. That, that they would take upon doing themselves yearly or bi-yearly that, that do a survey and see what the council's needs are and, and what kind of questions could be asked. And it could get costly for us to go out and each hire a consultant to develop a review for us as, as councillors. So if SUMA could maybe develop something like that for us, it would be a great practice. Thank you. We'll take that under advisement. I see JM at the back frantically writing notes. Oh, there we go, Sarah. <laughs> go ahead. Buck Bright with the Town of Kipling. Just a point on the salary discussion there. I got tired of the negotiations and every year with the foremans and things like that. And we basically set up a salary range that encompasses the number of years. So we don't have to have those discussions on an annual basis. And, let, and then that just leaves the administration to handle the salary things. I say, I already have a job. I don't need to do my administrator's job. So the point of governance, that's kind of part of that part. I also would encourage you uh, for your CAOs. My CAO really appreciates a performance review at the end of the year um, because most want feedback from their council and sometimes they don't get it. And the UMass site, I do believe, has a bit of a template format that you can use if you want to do that. And I think your, your CAO would probably appreciate some feedback. And what I do is I give that sheet to all our counselors to fill out, give back to me, then I have a discussion with the administrator without the counselor names on it and just highlight their points and they can, and the questions are like, what can they improve on, what do they do good on and those type of things and she really appreciates that feedback. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other questions. If Randy, I think you have a little preliminary, that would be lovely before the video. Sure. So uh, one thing we wanted to do in this session, since it was a Q&A talking about best practices, is just highlight an initiative between SUMA and SARM, which is the Municipal Peer Network. And it's a network that's been created uh, that involves elected and administrative officials. We have Brian Matheson, the Mayor of Lumsden here, who is also a Municipal Peer. Um, and it's just an opportunity, if you have questions and need to talk, about, talk to somebody about an issue, 
uh, nice to have an opportunity to reach out for free and talk to somebody that's maybe been there before. So we have a one or two minute uh, promo video for you to watch and then we'll back to Don. Working with groups throughout the province, you often found people say, isn't this the way everybody does it? So you get, you get insulated in your own community and learning what other people do uh, is, is tremendous knowledge and it can only help you. The peer network is for uh, those in administration, uh, administrative, administration staff, uh, elected officials, uh, public works staff perhaps that uh, need some assistance or guidance or just someone to talk to with regards to some uh, issues or matters that might be going on within their workplace. It, it means an opportunity for our members to have access to somebody who can help and guide them through some difficult situations if they're having issues, conflicts within uh, their organization those types of things. We see it as an, a network of individuals who are available to provide some advice, a sounding board, some guidance and some direction on where they might find the additional help that they might need. I found it as a bit of an honor that uh, looking back at my time on council, which has been nearly 20 years, um, found that we've experienced a lot of things and uh, solved a lot of resolutions. I, I think that we all understand that we can't always do it alone and I and having uh, that confidential sounding board, and I, I like to stress that confidential because sometimes it's hard to admit that you're having a struggle in a particular area or you um, just want to make sure that the details of the struggle that you're having remain uh, in that conversation that you're having, and I think you have to have that trust that that's going to happen. Well, uh, I would have had a sounding board to ask some what I thought at the time were silly questions, uh, which turned out to, they wouldn't have been had I had someone I could ask that I didn't feel intimidated by. I didn't have this network, so I really had to rely on the, the local people, and they were great, but they provided only that local knowledge as well. So this uh, gives you an opportunity to go far and wide. Great, thank you. So any closing remarks from the panelists? Anybody? Feel free. If anyone has any questions or, or wants to discuss anything further on, on some of the topic items or others, uh, I'll be here after as well. So. Okay. Well, thank you all very much for coming. We have a break now until quarter to 12. Thank you, Councillor Cody. <laughs> and then the leader of the official opposition is addressing the delegation at 1145. I have some thank you cards for the four of you. Let's give everybody a round of applause, please, for our panelists. Thank you for attending. Enjoy the rest of your day banquet tonight. Have a great rest of your SUMA convention. <laughs>